I want to t tell you something very interesting about the British Nuclear Test Veterans case against the Ministry of Defence, which has been running on for quite a long time now, but the specific case in, in, in the London court has, has lasted for about a year. My name is Chris Busby. I was an expert witness on this case, and I advised the, um, the lawyers, Rosenblatt's, on the case. Um, I want to talk to you about the way in which the Ministry of Defence handled this case and mishandled it, because it seems to me that either they are about to, or they already have, uh, folded up and agreed to give the the the, the, uh, the test veterans their um, uh, the money. In other words, not to pursue the argument in court, which they have been pursuing, which is that these veterans have uh, were never really exposed to radioactivity, and therefore, if they are more sick than the general public, which seems to be the case, it couldn't have been because of the radiation. Now, the key issue here in this case has always been what kind of radiation that they received. Because the, the test veterans, the British nuclear test veterans and all the other test veterans who, who were helping out in Maralinga in Australia and uh, at Christmas Island, um, all of these veterans, or a good proportion of them, wore radiation film badges. These are like little badges that you wear which, 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 which register the amount of radio, radiation that you receive. But these, but these badges will only, will only measure gamma radiation. Like, like photon radiation, they cannot measure your exposure to internal radiation, like um, inhalation of plutonium particles, inhalation of uranium, and so on. Now, um, one of the arguments has always been that it is this internal radiation that's unsafe. Now, the point is this, that the Ministry of Defence have always argued that there was no fallout, that these weapons were exploded quite far away from when most of, where most of these, these men, these soldiers, were stationed. And the amount of fallout that came down, that the, 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 the material that they could inhale or ingest, um, was, was very, very low. And their argument is based on the idea that if it had been high, there would have been high levels of gamma radiation as well. Now, as part of this case, I had to examine lots and lots of documents. Huge pile of documents. I mean, really huge pile. And I, like, tech, 38 box files of these uh, documents. And most of these, these documents were uh, irrelevant. But amongst these papers, I did find one report by a man called A. E. Oldbury. This was about a year ago I found this report. And I based my argument on this report. It was a measurement there was a set of measurements made by this chap, Oldbury, in 1963 of the radioactivity at Christmas Island on the runway. It was a report as part of a, 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 an operation called Operation Dominic. Now, on the basis of this, I was able to show, using some quite clever mathematics, I have to say, yeah, it, it was quite clever mathematics, that the ratio between the gamma and the beta radiation that Oldbury measured showed that the main component of, of the contamination at Christmas Island in 1963, five years after the last test had occurred, five years after the last test had occurred, and also after the Americans had already cleaned up the runway there, showed massive amounts of uranium. Massive amounts of uranium. And uranium is a key element because in the last ten years we've discovered uh, in radiobiology, that uranium has thousands of times more ability to harm genome, to harm, to cause genetic damage, than is modelled in the conventional risk. So that, so the, so that the key issue now comes down to whether these guys were exposed to uranium or not. Now, I've already had four or five, or actually six tribunal cases which I've won on this issue, because this Oldbury report shows the existence of uranium at Christmas Island. Anyway, about a year ago. In January 2009, I applied to the Atomic Weapons Establishment in Aldermaston under the Freedom of Information Act for all documents which they had, which the Ministry of Defence had, which showed measurements of radioactivity in the test sites. And after six weeks, I got a response from them, and they sent me a big piece of paper which had about 60 or 70 documents. And they said I had to choose two of these documents because to choose more than two would be more than £600 limit that the Freedom of Information Act um, uh, permitted you to have. You know. So in other words, they were saying it cost £600 to photocopy two documents. Right. So they said, well, I could complain about this to the Freedom of Information Officer, but before I did so, I had to do an inter ask them why, you know, I had to complain to them first of all. So, of course, I did complain to them, but while I was complaining to them, I also pointed out that the document I already had, the Oldbury document, Operation Dominic, didn't seem to be amongst the papers that they sent me. In other words, they were holding back some evidence. 
This was quite clear because I had the Oldbury document and it wasn't in the Freedom of Information Act request. So I said, while we're about it, you can investigate that as well. So the investigation rumbled on, rumbled on. And uh, round about the end of last year, in December, I got a, a, a response from the um, Freedom of Information Officer for the Ministry of Defence. And they said, um, she said, that the um, Operation Documents, uh, the Operation Dominic Documents, of which the Oldbury document was one, um, was not available to me, or, me or probably wouldn't be available to me, because it was a question of national security or international relations. These are two of the cutouts under the Freedom of Information Act. So I complained to one of the judges in one of the tribunals that I was involved in as an expert witness. And I said, can't you get this doc these documents um, uh, under some sort of subpoena, you know, to the court? Uh, and I also copied this um, letter to a number of the test fairs, some of the more radical test fairs, and then they started uh, making, making waves and complaining to Rosenblatt, uh, the solicitors, and the solicitors then asked their judge if they could get the documents and so on. And lo and behold, suddenly, all of the tribunals ceased. All of the tribunals I, was, I had penciled in, I had one in January with Dawn Pritchard, I had another one in February, there was another one in March. Suddenly they all disappeared. The, the MOD then said they were going to deal with them all together in one go. This was very sudden, very odd. How could they possibly do that? One guy's in Maralinga, one guy's in Christmas Island, you know, all these different... The only way they could do that is because they were going to actually give in. Because, and this is what I believe happened. I think once it came to the wire, and it became obvious that they were going to have to dish out all these documents that actually showed that they knew that the radioactivity was there on the test sites and that the place was completely rotten with uranium and that uranium was the cause of the effects in these test veterans. They knew that that case was lost. They knew that that case was lost. And at that point they would have had so much egg on their face and possibly legal proceedings against them for withholding documents under the Freedom of Information Act, documents from the court and so on. So they folded up. And my bet is that this is why they've settled the case. It's and, and they will want to settle the case under conditions where they're not going to have to release this information, but I am going to pursue them into the ground.